Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second day of the Times Talks 20th Anniversary Festival. I'm Michelle Gray, the creative director of the New York Times live conversation performance and screening series, Times Talks. For 20 years, Times Talks has showcased world-class journalists and creative thought leaders who have changed, oh, who have used the arts, sciences, and public po policy as a lens for change and a platform for conversation. Throughout this weekend, Times Talks will convene the brightest and most seminal voices for a series of substantive conversations and entertaining experiences. There's more in store for you following today's Times Talks. You can grab a cup of coffee at Bluestone Lane and vi visit our smorgasbord food hall downstairs. Browse a specially curated selection of books and New York Times merchandise at the Strand Bookstore and explore the absolute art Times Talks 20th anniversary collection. And after all that, take a well-earned break at the Design Within Reach Lounge and sink into Molly Finlay's Mr. and Mrs. Noodle Lounge. Now down to business. I'm delighted to welcome you to this afternoon's event with celebrated photographer Nan Golden, whose addiction to oxycodone inspired a series of honest self-portraits and the formation of an advocacy group, Pain, which is pushing pharmaceutical manufacturers to fund treatments for those suffering from addiction. Golden, whose intensely personal and transgressive work has been exhibited at the Whitney Museum of Art, Museum of Modern Art, and museums all over Europe, will be in conversation with Dr. Kolodny, senior scientist at Brandeis University and executive director of Physicians for Responsible Opioid Prescribing. Moderating this morning's conversation is Katie Benner, who covers the Justice Department for the New York Times. Most recently, she's written about sexual harassment in the tech industry and the legal contracts used to keep that behavior a secret. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Katie Benner, Dr. Alex Kolodny, and Nan Golden. Thank you so much for spending your beautiful Saturday here with us in this auditorium to listen to this talk. We're extremely honored to have both Nan and Dr. Kolodny here with us today. We've had our intros, and I think that we'd like to just get into the conversation, hop in. If you have any questions, there are mics set up around the room. Feel free to stand up and ask, and I'll call on you, because we'd love to have as much of your participation as possible. Um, I, I think maybe we'll start the conversation, Dr. Kolodny, with going back to a conversation you and I had to set the table about how you see this problem. You know, you've, you've talked a lot about how this is not, I guess, how, how did you put it, that this is an epidemic of addiction rather than a drug problem. Could you explain why that is? Yeah, uh, so you know, I think that we've seen the opioid crisis get worse uh, every year for the past 20 years. It's not a, a new problem. And some of the strategies that are necessary to bring it under control have been clear for a while. And I think one of the reasons we've failed to respond appropriately is that for many years the problem was misunderstood. It was misunderstood or maybe even intentionally misframed as a drug abuse problem. What we were hearing is that the, the problem with opioids is that a subset of our population are drug abusers who want to get high off of these drugs and they're accidentally killing themselves and that's a problem and we should do something about it. But these are wonderful medicines for millions of pain patients and we wouldn't want doctors to prescribe less in the effort to stop the drug abusers because you'd be punishing the pain patients. The issue was framed as if all of the harms were limited to so-called drug abusers and that was never true. These are good medicines for end-of-life care. They're good medicines when used for a couple of days after major surgery. But millions of people who've been prescribed opioids aggressively have become addicted. Thousands have lost their lives to overdoses. It was never true that the harms were limited to so-called abusers. But because the problem was misframed that way, I think what we saw from policymakers, what we, what we got from the federal government, was a very narrow focus on the issue of so-called non-medical use. The issue was framed as if the, old, the problem is kids getting into grandma's medicine chest, drug abusers, 
Nobody was asking, why does every grandma now have opioids in her medicine chest? And so what we saw for 20 years was the prescribing kept going up and addiction and overdose deaths went up along with it. What we've been dealing with is an epidemic of opioid addiction. Some people became addicted because they took opioids to experience the effect. Others became addicted taking opioids exactly as prescribed by doctors. Once you're addicted, you're not doing this for pleasure. Once you're addicted, you're doing it because you have to keep doing it to avoid feeling awful. So the correct way to frame our opioid crisis is as an epidemic of opioid addiction, which means that the reason we're experiencing record high levels of overdose deaths, the reason we're seeing heroin and fentanyl flood into communities across the country, the reason we're seeing a soaring increase in infants born opioid dependent, outbreaks of injection related infectious diseases, uh, children entering into the foster care system, impact on the workforce, the driver behind all of these health and social problems has been the sharp increase in the number of Americans suffering from the condition of opioid addiction. Got it. So, Nan, I think that we should go into your personal story because all of the things that Dr. Kaladni has described, you know, the stats, he's laid the table. Maybe you could just begin by explaining to us how you first encountered OxyContin and how it entered your life. I want to start by saying that um, I prefer to not use the word abusers and use substance use disorder. That's become important to my group. Um, also, some of the other terms. I can call myself an addict. I can call myself a junkie. But I think putting those words out there adds to the idea of the shame attached to it that's leading to the stigmatization, stigmatization that's the root of the, all this problem. As for me, uh, I got addicted in Berlin uh, three years ago, four years ago now. After surgery, they gave me OxyContin, 40 milligrams. And actually, it was too strong for me, which is ironic given where my dosage went. And I got addicted within a few days. It's an incredibly addictive substance. I continue to go to doctors. However, in Berlin, they're much more responsible about prescribing. There wasn't a flood of opioids yet that's happened in Europe. So I had drugs sent to me from America for a few years. Then the mail busted me. So I came back to New York and I had a dealer here that delivered 24 seven. So my addiction grew and grew and grew to the point where um, my life had become extremely narrow. It was, my life became tiny. I was unable to leave my bed, my room. I didn't see the daylight for years and I didn't have contact with the world. I didn't even know about the internet. I completely missed the 21st advent of the 21st century. So it got to a point where I was using 400 milligrams a day. And then I accidentally snorted fentanyl and I overdosed. But I came back, obviously. Uh, maybe we could look at a couple of your photos. You took a photo of your first night on OxyContin, and I'm wondering what compelled you to take that photo. I think we have it queued up here. Because it was a new experience, because originally I was high. Mm. The first days that you take opioids, you're high. Your pleasure is one of the parts of addiction. It starts with Pleasure leads to necessity, which leads to horror, basically. So I took this to remember what it was like the first time. And then there's another photo that shows uh, on the carpet the, I, I guess what we would think of as, you know, looks like prescription drugs. One of the things that struck me out with this photo is these are not the, the materials you would think of when you think of addiction, you know, the sort of antiquated notions we have of it. And I'm wondering what... The point. Tums, you mean? Yeah, exactly. That's so what was going through your mind when you took this photo? Um, there's Adderall, which is another problem in America. There's heroin. 
it's sort of like, you know, one of those games where you find the details. Um, why did I take it? I think I was surprised myself mm. by looking at the rug in my bedroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there's a very striking image that's um, become extremely well known of you having a cigarette uh, with these two women. Could you explain to us where you were in your uh, cycle of addiction at this point? That's right near the end. Um, I had accidentally, in this case, snorted ketamine. And so I was having a near-death experience. And these two women were running around naked with whipped cream. It was like Satyricon at night. <laughs> but at that point, I couldn't go anywhere or do anything without OxyContin. So Dr. Kalading, when you're talking to patients and when you're in your work, Nan's personal story, how does that mirror the stories of the people who you see? Well, among people I've been treating who are suffering from opioid addiction, uh, I'd say that in Nan's age group, uh, the vast majority of the patients that I've treated developed opioid addiction almost exactly the way Nan did, uh, receiving a prescription originally for a, a medical problem. Uh, among younger patients that I've uh, treated who were opioid addicted, some became opioid addicted through medical treatment. It could be a young person with a serious chronic medical problem put on long-term opioids. Other young people have become opioid addicted with a brief medical exposure that where they didn't really become addicted from uh, taking Vicodin for a few days after their wisdom teeth came out, but basically they got their first taste of the drug from the dentist or from a doctor after a, a minor injury. And at some point after that, there was a period of recreational use and then they got hooked. Uh, but once people get hooked, uh, regardless of how they got hooked, it's a, a very similar story to uh, what Nan experienced where um, your, your life spirals down. And um, I think that there's this notion, uh, and which is why I don't like the idea, uh, the term addict either. Uh, there's a notion that you know, people with addiction or, or addicts are pleasure seeking or that it's an alternative lifestyle and they're enjoying themselves. And as you can see in Nan's uh, photography and in Nan's story, uh, people who are addicted are really suffering and, and many want help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I would say sorry. No, go ahead. I would say that OxyContin isn't fun. It's not a pleasure drug, um, as opposed to other illegal drugs. And this is a legal drug. Um, it's also that people, including myself, live, stay on the drug out of fear of withdrawal. And I stayed on it a year longer than I wanted treatment because of that fear. Mm -hmm. It's a gripping fear. That fear of withdrawal is something that the pharmaceutical companies are now only beginning to address. So I think that we should maybe talk about the role of the pharma companies, in particular the Sackler family. Um, you know, Dr. Kaladi, maybe you could talk a little bit about why you believe that this is a pharmaceutical driven crisis. And then, you know, Nan has a lot of thoughts on the Sacklers because they're extraordinarily tied, well tied to the art world. Yeah, I've really been uh, rooting Nan on as she takes on the, the Sackler uh, family because. The, the reason that we have this epi <laughs> the, the reason that we have this severe epidemic of, of opioid addiction, the reason we've seen the sharp increase in the number of people with this condition is because starting in around 1996, the medical community became much more aggressive in uh, our use of these medications, we began prescribing them for conditions where we had previously known not to, to give them. And the reason that the prescribing really took off, and it wasn't just OxyContin that took off in the late 90s, but Vicodin starts going up, morphine starts going up, all of the different opioids start to go up in the, in the prescribing, and as they go up, addiction and overdose deaths go up right along with the increase. The reason that the medical community changed the way it was prescribing is because we were responding to a brilliant, multifaceted marketing campaign that was really uh, launched by Purdue Pharma, uh, the, the maker of OxyContin, when it introduced that drug in, in 1996. And it, it wasn't that doctors just heard directly from the drug company 
that patients who take the medicine rarely get addicted. Um, we were hearing this from pain specialists, eminent in the field of pain medicine, who were on the Speakers Bureau for, for Purdue Pharma. We were hearing it from professional societies, like the American Academy of Pain Medicine and the American Pain Society. We were hearing it from our state medical boards, from our hospitals, from every different direction. We were hearing that if you're an enlightened doctor in the know, you'll be different from those stingy puritanical doctors of the past that were allowing patients to suffer needlessly. You'll understand that opioids are a gift from Mother Nature and should be <laughs> used much more for, for people with, with pain. And as we responded to this brilliant campaign underwritten by Purdue Pharma, and the prescribing went up, it, it led to a public health catastrophe. Mm -hmm, absolutely. I think that we have a photo of a collage of all of the Sackler Museum wings. And the Sackler family made its fortune from Purdue Pharma. They worked very, very hard to make sure that their name, which graces so many museum wings all over the world, was never directly connected to their work in the pharmaceutical industry. So Nan, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you first encountered the Sacklers, what you knew of them as an artist, and then how you came to know of them as the driver behind your addiction. I had grown up with Sackler wings. I'd grown up with the Sackler, Arthur Sackler Museum in Boston. So the name was extremely familiar to me. It represented halls of museums that I love. And then I read a piece in the New Yorker and press in the New York Times and in Esquire that spelled out the relationship between one family, the Sacklers, and the opioid crisis in detail. And it was absolute vindication of them. There was also an article in the New Yorker that said, where are the activists like in the AIDS crisis? Mm -hmm. And I was present in the early AIDS crisis. I knew friends who were involved in ACT UP at the very inception. They had a group called Silence, uh, Silence Equals Death before ACT UP. And they met in somebody's living room. And now I have meetings in my living room. I realized after I got clean, that uh, there was a huge, I mean, that I wasn't alone because I had been alone for years. And I realized that there was a huge problem. And I was motivated to do something against the world right now, against the horror of this country. And So I chose what I know best, what I know in my own body, which is addiction. Mm -hmm. And I decided to tar target the Sacklers through their philanthropy because no one else was doing this. There weren't really, there wasn't a real presence of people on the ground fighting the crisis. It's beginning. But I decided that going through the museums, that's where they live. That's where they'll hear us. Yeah. And we have a video of the demonstration that Nan organized at the Met. I'm wondering if we could cue that video up and uh, take a look at it now. There's one family at the eye of the storm, the Sacklers. Their fortune is from pills. They've washed their blood money in the halls and walls of museums all over America. It's time for them to make reparations to those they harm.
extraordinary looking photo of one of the Oxycontin bottles we might want to be looking at for the next part of the conversation. Uh, so what Excuse was- Excuse me, I have a souvenir. Oh. <laughs> this is one of the bottles that was thrown into the temple of, De the water around the temple of Dender. We chose it because it's so beautiful and we wanted to make a big impact. Absolutely. Absolutely. We threw a thousand, over a thousand bottles into the water and they had to close the wing. So, and it's on the Sackler's webpage. If you Google Sackler, the action comes up. So has the family responded to you? Has the family responded to either of you? Both of you have done a lot to bring their names into the light uh, and connect it to this, to this crisis. Yes, they've responded to me. The first thing I did was publish an article in an art form with six pages, six spreads of pictures of myself during my act of using, and these pictures of the Sackler wings all over America and the UK. And she wrote, Elizabeth Sackler, who's the founder of the feminist wing at the uh, Brooklyn Museum, wrote to me saying that uh, she, wanted it to be clear that being a descendant of Arthur Sackler, who was dead at the time that OxyContin was developed, wasn't responsible. And that that part of the family had no part, had not inherited a penny from OxyContin. She was appalled by what was going on with Purdue Pharma. So I'm publicly calling her to meet with us. Mm -hmm. and to be an ally in our next demonstration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm publicly enough. calling right now. <laughs> <laughs> right, and so Ms. Sackler, it's not enough to just disavow your family. You should probably take some action. Then Jillian Sackler wrote to me after the action. This letter was much stronger, saying that I had to, it was directly my name, and saying that I had to be clear that we kept our, Arthur's name out of the discussion. Every time we spoke, we had to mention that Arthur wasn't responsible. And the issue is not one pill that Purdue made. It's the fact that he was inducted into the Advertising Hall of Fame. He was the one who created the entire advertising campaign that was used so successfully for OxyContin. And his first drug was Valium. Mm -hmm. He made the first million dollar drug in America. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Kolodny, there was a moment where uh, pharmaceutical led groups were actually calling for you to leave Brandeis because they did not like your message. This is a pharmaceutical led problem. Has the tide changed for you? Do you think that more people are coming around to agreeing with you? Uh, the medical community is. Um, I still get uh, a fair amount of um, uh, hate mail. Um, and from, uh, from some groups, I think, uh, there are pain patients who are, many patients who are on opioids who um, uh, would have a very hard time ever coming off. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've been manipulated uh, effectively by manufacturers and, and some of these groups get a lot of money from, from uh, not just Purdue but other drug companies that make opioids and are able to get these uh, advocates to uh, fight for them uh, effectively or to fight against regulation of, of opioid manufacturers. Something that we've seen is not just that the Purdue Pharma and, and other drug companies that saw how well OxyContin worked for Purdue and got their own opioids on the market and promoted them in the same way. Uh, it's not simply that they uh, changed the way the medical community prescribes and it led to this epidemic. They've worked very effectively to block interventions that might result in less prescribing. So when state governments or federal governments over the past few years have started to figure out that the way doctors are prescribing is why we're in this mess and they start to introduce regulations, uh, what we see is very effective pushback to try and preserve the status quo of aggressive prescribing. And mm -hmm. the Associated Press and Center for Public Integrity did an investigation of what they termed the opioid lobby, the manufacturers and the distributors and and the groups that are benefiting from the, the status quo of aggressive prescribing and, and the efforts they've been involved in uh, to block cautious prescribing efforts. And 
what they found in their investigation is that the opioid lobby has actually outspent the gun lobby by eight times. So, um, so it's been a very hard fight for, for quite a while, but we have made progress. So uh, a group I'm involved with, Physicians for Responsible Opioid Prescribing, in 2010 when we first formed, and we started to put out educational materials for, for doctors that had very different messages on them. Uh, the, the materials we were developing were designed to explicitly correct the misinformation that would lead to overprescribing. So, you know, st you know, statements like opioids are in fact addictive if, if taken uh, long term and that they don't work well for chronic pain if you're taking them around the clock for weeks and months and years. When we put out those materials, and we reached out to our professional societies because we were from different specialties. Uh, and some of us were even on the boards of our professional uh, societies when we said we've got this new material that we want to disseminate uh, and we want your help with this. Uh, when our colleagues saw what we had, had written, uh, uh, they all refused. The only professional society that was willing to sort of help with dissemination was the American College of Medical Toxicology, the, the docs that treat overdoses, and uh, the other professional groups refused. And it wasn't simply that the professional societies were getting money into their foundations from, from the pharmaceutical companies. It was that our peers at that time, when they saw what we had written, to say anything negative about opioids in 2010, after 15 years of doctors hearing that people are suffering because of under-prescribing, it was almost a taboo mm. to say anything critical about opioids, and that certainly has changed. And thank, uh, the CDC has been very helpful in, in changing uh, the, the medical community's view. So starting in around 2011, the prescribing has become a bit more cautious. It's trending in the right direction. There's still massive over-prescribing today. The United States is prescribing almost double what's prescribed in Canada, and Canada has a very serious problem as well, and far more that, than what's prescribed in, in Europe. So we have a long way to go, but it is trending in the right direction, and I think the medical community is starting to figure out that we made a terrible mistake. It's trending in the right direction here in the United States, but Nan, you've made the great point that as the pushback is happening here in the U.S., Purdue Pharma is expanding globally. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, they now have a company called Mundi Pharma, which is traveling around the world, and I'm terrified of it because it's going to become a global crisis. They've already moved into Brazil. They've moved into Latin America, into China, and they're moving into Europe. And the same techniques are being used. Yeah, so uh, what we're seeing is they're using the exact same playbook that worked in the United States. So the medical community in Western Europe and in Central Europe, South America, Asia is hearing the same message as we heard, that patients are suffering, that all of the good reasons that we should be cautious with opioids are barriers to compassionate pain care, and um, they're having uh, quite a bit of success. So in Europe, the prescribing is going up, not to the same extent it did in the United States, but in other countries, it's really beginning to take off, and we have to be really careful or, or, or uh, to avoid other countries following in our footsteps, and it, it does look like that's starting to happen. I think it's too late. Uh, we need to, after I uh, target the Sacklers, and I'll take on the global crisis <laughs> with everyone's support. Absolutely. I want to ask you a question, Dr. Kladny. Sure. What are we going to do for people who are addicted and are being cut off suddenly? So that's a really good question. We have about 10 million Americans who were put on chronic opioids. Uh, some are on very high doses, uh, dangerously high doses, at, and are at uh, really a significant risk of, of death from, from prescriptions that they're receiving from doctors, legitimate prescriptions. In fact, when you look at the people dying from prescription opioid overdoses as opposed to heroin or fentanyl, the vast majority of the people overdosing on the pills are receiving legitimate prescriptions from doctors. So I would say for the patients on the dangerously high doses, doctors have to help them come down on the dose. One issue we're dealing with 
is that some of the most aggressive prescribers are doctors who are older and um, some of them are beginning to retire and um, as they retire other doctors don't want to take these patients on who are on uh, sometimes really crazy cocktails of, of, of medications and since we don't have adequate access to addiction treatment and nobody wants these patients we really have to we're, there's a, a, a serious issue here that that's not really being well addressed and and some of these people who really need help coming down on the dose um, they're, they're not getting that help and they're very fearful um, I think there are programs out there that can work with these patients and get their doses down. Sometimes you can get them off completely. If you can do that, the quality of life for that patient will often improve. But many of these patients really need to be kept on, on opioids and uh, we have to be careful that, that doctors don't start firing these patients. Many doctors don't understand how hard it is to come off and so they're saying to the patient, you know, your backache should have gotten better five years ago, I, I'm not going to keep giving this to you. Uh, you'll, I'll give you one, one more month and then you've got to be off. And um, the doctor can get themselves out of the situation pretty easily, but because the doctor decides to stop prescribing doesn't mean the patient's problem is going to go away. Unfortunately, uh, oh, sorry. No, no, I'm sorry, please. I keep interrupting you. I'm so sorry. Unfortunately, it's driving people that might not go to the black market, driving them to the black market. And there we have heroin and fentanyl, which is killing people like flies. Yeah, so there is a, a, a popular narrative right now that, um, that there was a crackdown on the pills and the drug abusers, is the, uh, I don't like that term, but that's the, the narrative, the, the drug abusers are, are all switching to heroin and fentanyl. And it's very easy to see why people would believe that this is, is happening because when you look at overdose deaths since around 2011, Overdose deaths involving the pills, they haven't come down, they've sort of leveled off at a very high level, but overdose deaths involving illicit opioids have started to really skyrocket. And so people are looking at the, the overdose death trends and are, are assuming that what this means is the drug users have switched. That's not exactly what's going on. There's been switching from the very beginning of the prescription opioid crisis, particularly young people, because if you became addicted to pills prescribed to you by a doctor, um, if you're young, if you're a healthy looking 25 year old, it's hard to keep going back to that doctor to get a large supply. Doctors don't like to give healthy looking 25 year olds a large quantity every month. So the same way they might be comfortable prescribing that way to an older person with multiple medical problems. So from the beginning of the prescription opioid crisis, young people in their 20s and 30s were switching to heroin and when you compared overdose deaths up until around 2011, 2012, when you compared the deaths in the younger folks who were switching to heroin, when you compared them to the older people who were dying from pills prescribed to them by doctors, we were seeing more deaths in the older people prescribed pills by doctors, a lot more. What starts to happen in 2011 is the deaths among heroin users begin to take off very rapidly. And it wasn't because of a sudden switching in the context of a crackdown. There really hasn't been a crackdown. The prescribing has only been reduced a little bit. What starts to happen is the heroin supply becomes much more dangerous. Increasingly, it has an extremely potent synthetic opioid fentanyl mixed into it. And so with the emergence of fentanyl, we're seeing in these young folks who switched soaring increase in overdose death. There's another group, though, that's been affected by by fentanyl, and it's a group that we really don't talk about uh, much when we talk about the opioid addiction crisis. Um, it's the individuals who are really survivors from the heroin epidemic of the 1970s, mm -hmm. and these are uh, folks who were more likely to be non-white and from inner city communities, and um, these are mostly, more often men who have survived with their heroin addiction for many years, they, they really beat the odds even when HIV hit and tens of thousands of injection drug users died, they survived that. They've seen their friends die of overdoses. So for 40 or 50 years, they've lived with their addiction to heroin and now with the emergence of fentanyl in that group, the overdose deaths are soaring. So in the South Bronx, Central Brooklyn, in parts of inner city Washington DC, Philadelphia, 
we're seeing a very large increase in older African American and Latino men um, from, from heroin with fentanyl in it. So what I'm really <coughs> suggesting is we have three groups of opioid addicted Americans, a younger group that's been switching to heroin for a while, um, an older white group that became addicted to pills prescribed to them by doctors and have been overdosing on the pills, and a third group um, that's dying right now at a high rate, survivors of a previous epidemic. Great. Uh, let's go to an audience question. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm a physician here in New York and deal with uh, patients. I'm not an addiction specialist, but with patients with chronic opioid addiction. And in the last year and a half, um, a number of these patients have been referred to uh, addiction people, pain management at Columbia, who have switched them to buprenorphine with, I have to say, remarkable results. And attending other conferences such as this, you never hear it discussed. And there may be reasons for that, but perhaps you could just address that briefly, Dr. Kaladny. Oh, I'm, I'm very glad you brought that up. So uh, buprenorphine, uh, which is also called Suboxone, that's a, a brand name for, for the medicine, is I, I believe the first line treatment for opioid addiction. Um, what we just heard is that there are many pain patients who may be addicted to their medication, who you can put them on buprenorphine and, and they do very well, and that's absolutely true. It's, I think, excellent for, for that group. It's also the first line treatment for people who are addicted to heroin and, and using other opioids. And I truly believe that if we had better access to that treatment in the United States today, we would see deaths beginning to come down. And um, it's, it's very unfortunate, though, that there are many rules and barriers to doctors prescribing buprenorphine uh, for opioid addiction. It's safer, much safer than other opioids, yet we require doctors to take an eight-hour training course before they can prescribe that medicine. And then we cap the number of patients that they're allowed to treat. So the vast majority of doctors in the United States are not allowed to prescribe this medicine. Meanwhile, for, for the pills that have caused this epidemic and that are responsible for many deaths, there are very few uh, restrictions. Any doctor with a, a DEA registration or nurse practitioner or physician assistant is allowed to prescribe as, as much OxyContin as they want to as many patients as they want. I'd like to take a step back because what we're looking at is a massive health crisis that, as we saw during the election, became a big, a big point of contention during the presidential election. Who was going to help all of these suffering people? Donald Trump seemed to deliver the more resounding message on that front, and now he's our president. <clears throat> so what was going on? Both of you have... <laughs> Just going to gloss right over that and keep going. Uh, so what was going on in the Obama administration? Both of, you had, both of you in different ways have made the connection between what happened with the opioid crisis and what happened with HIV and AIDS. The, for, for Barack Obama, this, you know, Barack Obama is to the opioid crisis what Ronald Reagan was to the HIV and AIDS crisis. What was happening in his administration? Why was he ignoring this? What, 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 what happened? I, so I, I think that comparison of President Obama may sound strange comparing President Obama to Ronald Reagan, um, but uh, I do think uh, that in the same way Ronald Reagan uh, refused to speak uh, publicly about, the, about AIDS or HIV infection during his presidency, and I think we, we knew why, because we had a, a, an epidemic affecting stigmatized groups, gay men and injection drug users, um, it wasn't until very late in his presidency, his last year in office, that Ronald Reagan ever spoke or, or uttered the word HIV in, in public. And there are many people who believe that had the Reagan administration acted more forcefully to HIV early on, that you know, we might have prevented thousands of people from, from dying or even getting uh, HIV infected. Um, President Obama, uh, I think, um, similarly ignored the opioid addiction epidemic. President Obama did not speak publicly about the opioid crisis until his last year in office. The opioid problem was already severe when he came into office in 2008. Mm -hmm. By 2010, the CDC was already calling it an epidemic 
By 2010, the CDC was already calling it the worst drug addiction epidemic in United States history, yet President Obama didn't speak about it until late 2015. When he finally started to speak about the problem, he said the right things, and when he finally paid attention, he also sought some funding for the opioid addiction epidemic, but it was, it was very late. And you know, to the extent that people in regions of the country that went for Trump uh, in the election, to the extent that they felt that the federal government had failed them, and that might explain why they went for, for, tr for Trump, um, I think the opioid crisis is an example of the federal government failing those communities. Mm -hmm. Can we bring up the Warren bill? We haven't yes. brought that up yet. That's I'm right. saying, man, you want me we to bring have that legislation up? now, yeah. If, did you want to talk about the Warren bill? I want, I'm not a policy person, <laughs> okay. but my group strongly supports it. Yeah. It's the best thing that could possibly happen. She's actually proposing $10 billion a year for 10 years to fund treatment and education. She's proposing that the money will be sent to states that are worse, offended, worse affected, and that the money will get directly to the people involved, the people affected. It will be on the front lines. It won't get caught up in the normal government uh, lies. Um, it's the best thing. It's like a dream. It's possibly not going to pass. It's being uh, proposed next Wednesday, and everyone needs to write to Elizabeth Warren in support of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, you want to um, explain it better? Sure, I, I, I will. <laughs> so um, I, I do think that this may be the single uh, most important legislation that's uh, being proposed to address the, the opioid addiction epidemic, and there's a lot of legislation being proposed right now. Um, so if we really want to see overdose deaths start to come down, uh, what I think has to happen is that for somebody who's opioid addicted, um, they have to be able to access effective treatment more easily than they can access heroin, fentanyl, or, or opioid pain medicine. If you're opioid addicted, when you wake up in the morning, and, and Nan can uh, tell you what this is like firsthand, um, when you wake up in the morning, you're probably already feeling sick, and you know that pretty soon you better use or you're going to be feeling very sick. And if, you're, if you've got 20 bucks in your pocket and you know where you can go buy heroin um, to avoid feeling really sick, that is exactly what you're going to do. What we want is for that individual to be able to walk into a treatment center, outpatient treatment center, and on that same day, regardless of their ability to pay for their treatment, be started on, on uh, possibly buprenorphine, effective outpatient treatment for their opioid addiction. What we decided as a nation during the AIDS epidemic was that if somebody was HIV positive, that they should have access to antiretroviral therapy regardless of their ability to pay for it. And we created a new funding stream, the Ryan White funding stream, so that somebody who was HIV positive could get treatment that would save their life. And I think that is what we need to address the opioid crisis. And so far, the only legislation that's been proposed that would do that is this bill uh, uh, from Warren and Cummings. And so I, I do think we have to fight very hard for passage of that legislation. Absolutely. Are there any other audience questions? Yes. Do you mind going to one of the microphones? So sorry. And if you have a question, please feel free to approach the mic. I see another person coming on this side. Well. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. So I have two young kids, but I have friends that have older kids already that have become addicted to various drugs. So throwing money at, at you know, rehab facilities and stuff might be a great idea, but have you found, is there an effective treatment? Because I know friends of mine have spent so much money, like hundreds, I can't even put a dollar figure on it. They're desperate to get their kids clean. And they go to facility after facility and facility, and they leave, and their kid is clean maybe for a little bit, but it's never effective. So is there an effective model that can work? And my second question is, how do we keep the younger kids before they even get hooked? What is an effective education program 
Because funding an education program without knowing what's going to really work, do you say, like, the say no to drugs? I mean, what do I tell my children? Mm -hmm. So uh, what uh, many people uh, who have opioid addiction in their, in their family, um, someone they love is addicted, um, what they will seek for their loved one often is, is detox and rehab. And we have middle class families emptying out their bank accounts to send a loved one to a, a drug rehab. And then their loved one gets out you know, 28 days later and within a week has, has relapsed. And, and sometimes because their tolerance went down while they were in rehab, if, when they pick up again, they're very high risk for, for an overdose death. Not only doesn't that treatment really help many people, but it, it sets up many people for an overdose death. And, and that's really what most people keep reaching for. Um, sometimes it is necessary to put somebody in a bed temporarily if their uh, addiction is very severe and, and they need to be stabilized. And sometimes it's necessary to give the family a bit of respite because if you've got a loved one who's addicted, they can be driving you crazy. But you don't need to put people in beds. Uh, certainly rehabs are not the mainstay for this epidemic. We need easy access to effective outpatient treatment. Most people who are opioid addicted are not going to do well with abstinence-based approaches. They need management with, with medication, and buprenorphine would be the first line. For some people, methadone maintenance is also an important option, especially if um, they haven't done well on buprenorphine or they, they need the structure of, of a methadone clinic. I know some people may hear this and they say, you know, it, that you know, you're not really in recovery or you're not treated if you're still on a on a medicine that, that isn't true. Uh, people who are effectively treated with medication for their opioid addiction look, feel normal, are able to take care of their family, um, have fully productive lives, but not enough people are accessing that treatment. As far as education, uh, I don't really agree with uh, President Trump that we should uh, uh, tell kids don't just say no and bring back uh, Nancy Reagan's campaign. This isn't so much. It worked much, so well the first time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this isn't about so much telling kids don't do drugs. This is, if we really want to prevent opioid addiction more than anything else, we need much more cautious prescribing so that we don't directly addict our patients and so that we don't indirectly cause addiction by stocking homes with a highly addictive drug. There is a need to get the public better information about the risks of these drugs. But to prevent opioid addiction, we have to change prescribing practices. Nan, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I know of two models that I've seen that are effective. One is in LA, and it's called Bat Teshiva. And it's a Jewish rehab. It has 140 beds. It has prison outreach. It's a community. And the opposite of addiction is community. The opposite of addiction is connection with other people. They take prisoners. There's about a 30% prison population. They go into prisons and actually do outreach. And it's an amazing place. I'm not proposing that it, religious places are necessary, but a community with a common purpose works amazingly. And this woman started it in the 90s in a small house in downtown LA. And now it's grown into a, a big rehab center, a big center. And I, saw, I went out there to film, and I saw incredible success. I don't know that it's appropriate to, your, to kids. Uh, I think the minimum age is 18, but it's a model. And the other model that I subscribe to is at Mass General Hospital in Boston. There's a program there called The Bridge. And when people come into the ER on an overdose, or if somebody comes to the hospital and shows interest in getting help, they, it, they have doctors 24-7 that can induct buprenorphine. And then there's an outpatient program that has therapy and groups and help with life problems. I also don't know if that applies to teenagers. I think it's a great question. And personally, I'm interested in the cause of addiction and the pain that causes addiction. 
I don't think people just get addicted to substances. I think they're born or they grow up with a great deal of pain um, and they look to drugs to relieve the pain and then it becomes pain. Nan, how did you break your chemical dependency? Um, that's a good question. I, uh, I finally got into rehab. I went to an incredible rehab that nobody can afford, including myself. And it was basically psychiatric and science-based. And I stayed there for two and a half months. I did start taking buprenorphine. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's a wonder drug. Mm -hmm. I'm able to function. I don't see it as an alternative drug. It's an opiate um, agonist and an opiate opioid antagonist, so you can't get high on it. I don't, I'm sorry, I can't offer help. Now, uh, my, I have another, just a little quick question on that. Is there a film out there or a movie or something that everyone can access right now to show to their family or their kids that you think is the best information about addiction, about the problem, about preventing it? Has anything been done that you can recommend? There's a great movie called The Trade but I don't know if it's a learning film on that level. It's about, it's an incredible TV series. It starts with the cartel in Mexico. It traces it to the police action in Columbus and then to the life of an addicted person. Um, in terms of that kind of information, can you think of one? Yeah, I, I can. Yeah. So the um, HBO uh, documentary warning this drug may kill you is uh, a terrific documentary about the opioid addiction epidemic the documentary itself doesn't have good information for families um, or, or patients about what to do but if you go to the website for the documentary there are what they call I think web extras and there are some short videos uh, connected to the film on, on the HBO warning this drug may kill you website That's and I think they're they're right. excellent cut you off. I just want to be able to get to some of these other questions Thank before you. we run out of time. I just wanted, I wanted to, sorry, I'm sick, but I wanted to give her a book recommendation called Beyond Addiction, um, Center for Motivation and Change. It's science and kindness, and it's specifically for opioid addiction. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Foote, I don't know if you guys know him, but he does really good research, and it's all research-based, and it's for families. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question, please. Hi. Um, I guess it sort of piggybacks a little bit on the last one. Um, my sister died two years ago of a uh, heroin fentanyl overdose combination, and uh, she was on Suboxone. Um, and I was going to ask Nan, first of all, I deeply applaud you. I, um, I know firsthand how hard what you've done is, and I think I, I want to know if you'd be willing to share what went on inside of you to be able to get through recovery and to make the choice that this is going to happen now this way, and perhaps for those of us in this room who probably are struggling with people who are alive still, what can we do, if anything? Um, I think those who are left are, of course, always plagued with this feeling of, we could have done, we could have shown, oh, that moment, or that is, you know, what, if you don't mind sharing, what happened internally for you, the strength to, um, because it is so powerful, as you know. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I'm really touched. For me, I had spent two years, a year, looking at treatment centers all over the world and actually doing intakes with them on the phone. And in the end, I called the doctor that had gotten me clean in 1989. And I said, um, I want to come to your clinic, but I don't want to get off benzodiazepines, which I also was addicted to. And I said, are you going to force me to do that? And he said, we'll see, <laughs> which was the best thing he could have done. <laughs> In fact, they did titrate me off benzos, which took two and a half months. It's a bitch, that drug. Yeah, but in terms of 
Mm -hmm. What happened for me is my friends. Mm -hmm. My friends have always been the most important thing in my life. And, and being so isolated and then having your friends come in and help you find a place and show you support. But I'm sure you're showing support to the people you love. And I don't know, I think getting clean and staying clean, like maybe in the case you're talking about, um, are two different things. Yeah. And you have to kind of, when you get clean, you don't recognize yourself. You don't know who you are. Mm. And it takes years to really reconstruct yourself. Mm. And for that, you need enormous help. Yeah. Therapy, I think, mixed with, I think, Suboxone. But you have to have a kind of steely resolve. I don't know yeah. where that comes from. And I think, yeah, and I think she had it, but the fentanyl just, she didn't know, I don't think. You know, it was before, I mean, 2015, we were, it was on the, the beginning for me of even knowing that it was, it was, I'm sure it had been around for a while, but we weren't really hearing about it the way we are now, you know. Well, thank you. It makes it so dangerous to go back. I can't go back because I would die. Yeah. It's in pills, it's in marijuana, it's everywhere. Yeah. Thanks. And the next question. Um, I guess this question is kind of regarding, you know, the future of not only um, oxycodone and painkillers, but also from a generational standpoint, um, being 28 and seeing my friends on, um, during middle school, high school, you know, right, reaching puberty, um, being subscribed a lot of um, Adderall, um, benzos, clonopin, and, um, sorry, sorry about that. Um, and now we're seeing kind of like this addiction culture in Europe with, um, Xanax, and I just want to know exactly how that correlates. Um, there's a great documentary on Vice that has a short video of just this drug culture of numbing out, and doctor, I want your opinion. Do you think addiction is genetic? Do you think it is something that somebody can truly overcome, or is it a lifelong situation? Uh, a great question uh, and uh, your comment about uh, prescribing of other controlled drugs, uh, not just opioids, but stimulants and, and benzodiazepines. And there are uh, important uh, parallels. Um, opioids are not the only uh, medications that doctors have overprescribed. We've seen a very sharp increase in prescribing of stimulants. Um, you have uh, adults who walk into a psychiatrist's office or a primary care office um, being able to describe the symptoms of ADHD and walking out with, with stimulants and, and some of what you might call a cosmetic psychopharmacology, uh, which, which is a concern. And you know, uh, stimulants <coughs> and benzodiazepines are not quite as deadly as opioids. Uh, but certainly when, when benzos are mixed with opioids, it's, it's easily lethal. And so we, we definitely have a problem with overprescribing of many different medications in, in the United States and a problem of, I, I think, a pill for every ill culture. Uh, and it's hard to say, is there something uniquely American that, about us that we want a pill for every problem? Or are we sort of being led to believe there's a pill for every problem because you can't turn on the television without seeing an ad? Um, with regard to your question about genetics and you know, is addiction a genetic disease? Uh, genetics play an important role in, in, with addiction to drugs, but it, it's different for different drugs, and I'll explain what I mean. With alcohol, the vast majority of the population can be repeatedly exposed to alcohol and doesn't develop addiction to alcohol. And um, you know, there, there are a lot of people who drink in a way that's unhealthy and, and harmful drinking is a public health problem aside from addiction to alcohol, but it's, it's about 10% of the pop population that becomes addicted to alcohol and 90% of us can drink without getting addicted. 
And when you look at that 10% that gets addicted to, to alcohol, although we haven't identified the gene or the genes, we have good evidence that it runs in families. So alcohol is a less addictive drug, and genes play a very important role. When it comes to highly addictive drugs, like nicotine, or heroin, or oxycodone, or hydrocodone, uh, with the highly addictive drugs, the individual's characteristics are important, uh, but the, the inherent addictive property of the drug is also very important, and maybe even more important. So there was a time in the United States when about 60% of the adult men in the United States were addicted to tobacco. Uh, addicted to nicotine. So it's different for different drugs. And with the highly addictive drugs, uh, almost anyone who's repeatedly exposed can become addicted. And you're more likely to be repeatedly exposed if you're depressed and you're self-medicating. You're more likely to be repeatedly exposed if it's very accessible. Uh, you're more likely to be repeatedly exposed if a doctor tells you to take it. Dr. Kalani, uh, I want to interrupt. Do you think it would be too strong to say that the pharmaceutical industry has grown as it has in leaps and bounds over the last 20 years by purposely turning the population into addicts. Um, wait, yes. I just have one more. I want to go to the next. We only have time for the last two questions now because we're at the last five minutes. But this is no. This one's going off of um, pretty much the whole you know Xanax crisis and benzo crisis going on with, I would say, 20, 18 to 20 year olds generation below me. Um, and like fentanyl, there's also other additives that are being you know, made on the streets with these benzo drugs. And I just think you know, it's pretty much going to lead into the same story. Yeah. Um, Next question. So you guys have talked a little bit about sort of like what we can do at a legislative level, uh, what doctors can do. Is there anything you think pharma companies can be doing to help or change what they've been doing? Um, I, I don't think that we should be relying on pharmaceutical companies to do the right thing. I think we, <laughs> I, I think we need our regulatory agencies to do their job. And, and that's why to Nan's point, we should be talking to Elizabeth Warren and, support, and to Nan's point, that's why she supports Elizabeth Warren's bill. Yeah. I also think we need to get money from the Sacklers. They have a lot of it. Two things. Do you think that education needs to create people's more, I guess, suspicion to, you know, as I was to say no to drugs, like what do drugs look like? Doctors prescribe, you know, like just more understanding of that pharmaceutical and recreation drugs are very similar. Like I feel like children aren't told that. Like, mm -hmm. And also I think I heard about like something similar to ayahuasca, some sort of natural... Um, plant that helps with opiate withdrawal. I don't know if you have familiarity with that. I think you might be talking about kratom, or for the. Uh, I know oh. about kratom, but I thought it was oh. something different. Oh, okay. But it's I don't know. It's ibogaine, and I stand by it. I haven't done it myself. I know people who have. It's a herb. I mean, it's a root from a tree in Africa from the rainforest. It's used by indigenous people for hunger, thirst, tired. And it has shown properties that help heroin withdrawal, opiate withdrawal, miraculously. And um, it's not being used, of course. It's a Schedule One drug, because it doesn't make money for the government. And so I guess I, to, just to, in closing, um, we've spoken a lot about uh, why, you know, the roots of this problem, the growth of the problem, and ways to break the problem. And I think that one thing that we haven't really touched on is the intense stigma that still exists uh, around drugs, drug use, and addiction, the chemical addiction of drug use. What, are, what do you think would be the most important thing that we can do, the media could do, we could do in our own conversations to try to move away from that stigma so we could have a more productive conversation? The stigma is at the base of all of this. And criminalization helps the stigmatization because why would we be punishing people if they did nothing wrong? And uh, why are people looking at addicts 
addicted people as there, there are all these conceptions left over since the 70s that addicts are dirty, that you know, they're below moral, the moral code, they're not active members of society, they're unnecessary. And even people within society who are addicted, it's still stigmatized, I believe. It's looked at as a weakness. And instead of that, why aren't we looking at how we can help people? It's basis. I, I agree uh, uh, completely. I, I think stigma has worked uh, very effectively for the opioid lobby because they were able to say as addiction was rising that those are the drug abusers, which was, was never true. I think stigma has a lot to do with why some doctors overprescribe. They have in their mind what a drug addict might look like. And if they've got a patient who they know and like and they know the family, the idea that their pills could turn that patient they like into one of those people is, is, is foreign to them. Um, I do think that we're seeing a lessening of, of the stigma and maybe it's the silver lining. I hate that saying that there's any silver lining to our a public health catastrophe, but I think now that we have an epidemic that's hitting mainstream white America, we're, we're seeing more enlightened views about, about addiction with a few exceptions from the, the Trump administration about executing Excellent. drug dealers. You are generally hearing, even from conservative uh, politicians, we can't arrest our way out of this. Um, we have to see that people who are addicted have access to effective treatment. You didn't hear that during the crack cocaine epidemic or the heroin right, epidemic right. of the 1970s. It's good we're hearing it now. It's too bad we didn't hear it then. Well, thank you so much, both Dr. Kolodny, Nan Golden. We're extremely appreciative of your time. Thank you.